This is the year that much of mainstream America is accepting that we are either in or about to enter a recession. For communities of color, we've been there for the last year. There is a population out there that doesn't have access to the internet. We're really one-on-one -on -one connecting with people through text messaging. In that way, we're able to still inform these communities. Human lives are being politicized putting them on a one-way flight to Martha's Vineyard and essentially saying good luck and figure it out. Coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. This month, our Meet the BIPOC Press Roundtable is looking forward. What are the stories that will be driving news coverage in the coming year, especially for communities of color and the media that serve them? Every month here on The Laura Flanders Show, we invite the members of URL Media, a national network of black and brown-owned media outlets, to share their perspective on a key issue or issues. This time, we're looking at the year ahead. What stories are the networks, members watching on the economy, how housing, finance, politics, not to mention reproductive rights, voting, and public health. For this, I'm happy to be joined once again by Mitra Kalita, the co-founder of URL and the publisher of Epicenter NYC, a newsletter based in Queens, New York. Also with us from Miami, Alexandra Martinez, senior news reporter at PRISM, an independent nonprofit newsroom led by journalists of color and focused on justice. And Malak Silmi, the local government reporter for Outlier Media, a Detroit-based platform that works collaboratively with residents to keep government accountable. So where to turn up the heat, where to shed more light? We're talking about reporting in 2023. And I want to thank you all for joining the show today. Let's kick off with you, Mitra. You know, we always look forward. We start looking forward by looking back. And as I look back, I was reminded that this is essentially marking two years of us collaborating on this monthly roundtable of URL media existing. And I just wanted to ask you how it's going. It looks to me like it's going gangbusters. It's going great. Thank you, Laura. And thank you for being a part of that journey. Um, I think it's kind of impressive that we're starting 2023 with two members from Outlier and PRISM that weren't with us two years ago when URL launched. So one, um, you know, kind of not to bury the lead, but the size of the network feels a really important part of our growth. And then the scope of the network. So being able to include an outlet like PRISM that focuses on social justice issues and is for people of color, by people of color. Um, you know, someone like Outlier Media, I draw a lot of inspiration from its ability to text with um, its community and really use um, translations and, you know, languages uh, besides English at the inception of its reporting. And um, so I just feel like the story for us has been um, both a broadening of our scope and our reach, but not sacrificing the depth of service to our communities and the issues that we care about. We call this Meet the BIPOC Press. That term BIPOC was coming into sort of mass use when we started today. There's already some kind of pushback from different communities. How are you feeling about it? And remind people, you know, what it stands for and why it's important to you. So BIPOC stands for Black Indigenous uh, People of Color. Um, it is a controversial term. We've leaned into it because the roots of URL uh, we believe ourselves to be the only multi-platform, multicultural network of our kind, meaning we are black and brown. Um, and, you know, I've embraced the term, even though I have to say it doesn't roll off my tongue. Um, <laughs> that being said, um, one of the benefits of being a network that is, you know, I'll use the term again, by our people, for our people, is that we recognize the nature of being a part of this collective doesn't mean that you have to sacrifice who you are or the many facets of identity um, that we all bring to the table. Let me bring in our guests here. Alexandra, let's talk about your multiple identities, both as an individual and as an outlet. Um, talk a bit about PRISM, how you think about who it is you're serving, what your mission is, um, and what you bring to it, especially, Alexandra. 
Sure. Thank you so much for having me, Laura. So um, PRISM, as Mitra mentioned, we are a BIPOC-led newsroom, um, and that is incredibly important because uh, we are telling stories about um, communities that we ourselves as reporters have experience in. So that creates, um, it allows us to bring nuance to the reporting that we do, which without that nuance, you really can't have honest, uh, truthful storytelling. And so um, you asked me about my identities. I am Cuban American, I'm Latina, um, proud Miamian, born and raised. Um, and I bring that in everything that I, that I report on. And what about you, Malak? What can you tell us about outlier media that we need to know? So Outlier Media is led by women of color and we do focus on Detroit and Detroit itself is a huge city that ha is majority black. Um, so we really focus on some issues that pertain to black Detroiters. Um, me, myself, I am Arab American Muslim, specifically Palestinian American, and there are some um, there's an Arab American population in Detroit and um, through Outlier Media, I have been able to use my Arab um, heritage as well as our, my Arabic language um, to translate our services and our informational needs to Arab Detroiters, um, but also focusing on a lot of issues that Black Detroiters and other immigrant communities um, really face in Detroit. So let's talk about greatest hits. I have to say, I looked at Outlier Media's greatest hits of 2022 story. You collaborated on that story. Uh, I couldn't take my eyes off the videos of that ridiculous slide. Um, but I do know that there were other things that happened in Detroit this year that you reported on. What would you lift up as especially important or work that you're particularly proud of? I would say um, one article that we did work on this year was in collaboration with the Detroit Free Press. Um, at Outlier Media, we do collaborate with a lot of local media partners. Um, and we focused on this new uh, water affordability program that Detroit, the city of Detroit launched. Um, and it's to really make water more affordable for residents. And we have this problem in Detroit where um, in, in past years, water shutoffs was something that a lot of Detroit residents would um, face. I mean, it's frankly because they could not afford uh, the water bills. And so the city of Detroit launched this new water affordability program back in August. Um, and we wrote about it and we looked into it. But something that we have been focusing on is to see where that future funding is. Um, the program right now is using federal dollars as well as state dollars and regional dollars, but it's only meant to be funded for 18 months. Past that 18 months, there isn't really, uh, there are some efforts, but there isn't anything permanently secured. Um, so that's really something that I've been proud of um, focusing on and highlighting on last year and hoping to continue reporting in the next year. What about you, Alexandra? Greatest hits of 22? I think for me, the the coverage I did on workers' rights is something I'm I'm very proud of. Um, we we did a lot of coverage on um, Amy's Kitchen. So Amy's Kitchen is a vegan food company um, out in California, and they the workers decided to unionize back. It's been a year now, I think, in, since January of last year, um, and their employers immediately started union busting. Um, and most recently, the workers are calling on a boycott of Amy's Kitchen products. Um, and, you know, I've done a couple follow-up stories on that. And as a result of that, um, folks from No Evil Foods, another vegan food company, reached out to us at Prism. Um, and they as well experienced extreme uh, union busting when they tried to formalize a union a couple of years ago. And what was most interesting in this reporting is that these companies, you know, tout themselves as being ethical or morally conscious um, and, you know, being humane towards animals, but they're not treating their workers humanely. Mitra, I'm sure you have many things to choose from as you look back over the year, but what stands out? I think this is the year that much of mainstream America is accepting that we are either in or about to enter a recession. I think for communities of color, we've been there for the last year. And so um, you're seeing this with demand at food pantries, utilities, housing. Um, one of the things I'm proudest of is that we covered um, 
the explosion of um, food insecurity. What are the factors that are leading people to seek this help? Feels like the undercovered story in mainstream media. Malak, you talked about it, you touched on it, about relief programs, and it seems like that is going to be one of the big stories, at least for the first half of 2023. I mean, Detroit, under the American Rescue Plan, saw its biggest ever like investment of federal dollars, a, a one-time deal. I think it was over $800 million to Detroit. Much of that is set to expire. Yeah, definitely. So it's specifically with the water affordability program that is using ARPA funding. Um, and that's something that um, residents would want to see continue. Um, and so having the opportunity to have regional and uh, specifically federal funding um, back into the local communities and, and able to fund these programs that could potentially be long term and help our uh, Detroit residents is something that local activists and local residents have been pushing for um, and really to see that the city is listening to their concerns and able to come up with this um, program in order to end you know city shutoffs like the mayor has promised um, has been something that's been on the minds of a lot of uh, advocates and residents and alexandra you've been seeing this i think in relation to temporary um uh rights and, and visas for immigrants federal action on abortion pills. We're in a tremendous sort of tipping point moment, it seems to me, for all these kinds of actions. Yeah, absolutely. There's been a lot of changes. Uh, Most recently, the FDA did approve, um, you know, they eased access for the abortion pill over-the-counter mifepristone and misoprostol. which is great, but uh, Prism actually just came out with the story this morning that it, you know that ease of access is not really for everyone. You know, uh, BIPOC people are still going to have a harder time accessing these pills and this service because of where they are and what the what the laws are. Because abortion remains banned in so many states across the across the country. Yeah, I mean, the availability of the morning after pill, so-called, at chain stores doesn't help you if there isn't a chain store in your area. Absolutely. The expiring of a whole set of emergency uh, legislations when the emergency, especially for your constituents, isn't over, seems like an enormous story and alarm bells do not seem to be ringing in mainstream media, so-called. Thank you for raising that, Laura. Over the last two years, I think we um, know that the government wasn't perfect in its response to the pandemic, but at least there was federal funding behind a lot of initiatives, whether it was for small businesses to stay afloat or um, COVID testing or treatment um, and vaccines, of course. And so one um, concerning trend right now is that in our efforts to pretend that COVID is behind us, that the pandemic is over, you know, in the last three weeks alone of January, Epicenter has been uh, both reporting and receiving um, loads of reports on small businesses that have closed. Um, whereas two years ago, I think they saw that there was this lifeline. Um, this year, I don't think anybody is seeing that. Um, you know, just for Epicenter as well, we were the recipient of several grants to ensure that our vaccine equity and COVID testing work um, would continue. Um, both in information dissemination and working in um, underserved populations. That money has all dried up. Um, Our site supervisor in Southeast Queens, which has been a really hard hit area, a lot of restaurant workers there, um, just told me this morning in an email that she's going to continue to um, visit the site once a month and make sure that people are up to date on COVID information and testing. So that's the really concerning scenario that we're seeing right now. Let's talk a bit about how you do your reporting. And I want to come to you, Malak, with Outlier, because we just talked about lifelines and emergencies. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Outlier grew out of a kind of emergency that your community was not being served. And the lifeline that you discovered for doing some of the reporting was pretty close to hand, was local people. Um, Talk about your documenter program, how it works. And I was excited to see that in some of your stories, you can actually go and find online the full notes that your documenter um, took at a meeting? Yeah, so we operate, we have a text message service system as well as a documenters program. And both of these are really um, to connect with residents as well as to connect to local meetings. And so with our documenters program, we actually employ um, 
citizens from across the city, um, from across the state, to really go into these local meetings, whether virtually or in person, and just simply document, which means live tweet or open up a Google Doc and write down what you're what you're hearing. Um, and this has helped serve a lot of reporters as well as a lot of citizens and really anyone who's curious to hear about the different local meetings that are happening, regional meetings across the county and st- in city. And who are some of your documenters? Tell us, are these experienced journalists have been doing it forever, went to school? Not for at it? all. These are local citizens who are just, who might be like, who might be interested in just going to the city council meeting and sharing public comment um, or who are just interested in their local government. They are students. We have Wayne State University students local to Detroit. We also have older senior citizens. We have Detroiters. We have from the suburbs. It's a very, I would say, diverse pool of candidates who are applying for these meetings to go and really just document for for the sake of having that information out there. It's such a great program. So exciting. And spoke to a crisis in journalism that those were exactly the meetings that local media no longer had the resources to fund. How about you, Alexandra? What would you lift up in terms of how you're doing reporting that's maybe new or different or innovative? And how do you decide what to cover? Right. Well, I know that I I cover a wide breadth of of topics, Uh, workers' rights, immigration, LGBTQIA and gender justice, the economy, housing, um, as PRISM's um, senior news reporter, I, I yes, I cover a wide range. Um, so I my reporting is mostly remote. While I'm based in Miami, I do try and highlight, you know, everything that's going on here in Florida with Governor Ron DeSantis. There is no shortage of news um, from the Stop Woke Act to Don't Say Gay to all of the uh, horrible legislation that he is putting out there. Um, There's a lot to cover. Mitra, you always have your eye both on the network as a whole, nationally, even internationally, um, and also right here at home. And I saw a tweet um, about what happened at your local city council uh, person's home. Uh, Was it the night of Dr. King holiday? Yeah. So um, city councilman Shaker Krishnan, who, um, you know, we've, we've both done a lot of work with and and covered his, um, he's, his rise, he's the first Indian American um, city council uh, member in New York City um, and represents Jackson Heights, who the area that Epicenter was born out of. There have been um, much anti-gay um, protest across the country. And so one issue in Jackson Heights has been a group of protesters against um, a Drag Queen Story Hour. So Drag Queen Story Hour is uh, has been around for years. The protest about two weeks ago uh, really bubbled over where there was like dozens of protesters. Thankfully, the attendees to the Story Hour outnumbered the protesters. Our city councilman, when he was coming home on MLK Day after a day of service, encountered protesters on his doorstep um, who had all sorts of I mean, I think you can call them epithets. They're carrying signs and um, are very offensive. Um, His children are inside. And, you know, this is New York City. I mean, this I just want to really like kind of clarify, like the neighborhood we live in um, has been a haven for immigrant America, for gay America. I would even say for everyone, America, that's what defines us. It's absolutely horrific. Speaking to the anti-trans legislation that's popping up now, it's only been a month and we're already seeing, I think it's 11 states that have anti-trans legislation on the books. And what's scary about this legislation is they're trying to ban um, transitioning unless you're older than 26 years old. So these are adults, grown adults that are having their autonomy stripped from them, which is absolutely horrifying. Um, And then in addition to that, um, there's anti-abortion legislation that is being considered that could potentially incriminate the the pregnant person. So it was never, you know, we're, we're, how it all ties is that it's this continued turn to the right. One other theme that's come up repeatedly for our epicenter audience that's dividing our communities, which is um, the migrant um, influx into New York City. Part of our community continues to use the refrain, we came in the right way. Um, This is, of course, an immigrant Jackson Heights. Um, The right way, you know, during my father's time in 1971, green cards were plentiful. That's no longer the case. And so I think there's a question over 
the right way in 1971 versus 2023. I just wonder how you all are covering this. And, um, you know, I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say we're, we're three either immigrants or children of immigrants or how, how this is playing out in your communities. I'm actually working on a story um, about the latest Biden administration policy on uh, folks arriving at the border. So now if you're from if you're coming from Haiti, if you're coming from Cuba, if you're coming from Nicaragua, if, and if you arrive at the border, you're immediately going to be turned back. Um, and the the rhetoric that I'm hearing as well in Miami is the exact same. Well, our our people came the right way, but the infrastructure is not nearly the same, and we're not being met with the same resources as you know our ancestors were or our parents were. Um, so it's scary, and a lot of the advocates that I speak to, and a lot of the immigrants that I speak to, are scared because human lives are being politicized, essentially. You know, Ron DeSantis and um, Governor Abbott in Texas are playing political games with people's lives, putting them on a one-way flight to Martha's Vineyard or to New York City, and essentially saying, good luck and figure it out without any concrete resources being available to them. And my luck to you. And I, I haven't forgotten that you said you're Palestinian American. And that's a story. The story of what is happening under the new uh, extreme right government in Israel is one that is heating up just now. And we know is infamously um, challenging, let's just say, for our media to cover fairly. As a Palestinian American, as an Arab American, as a Muslim American, I am um, in tune with a lot of the rhetoric across the country, as well as, you know, local immigrants here. We have a lot in Detroit, as well as surrounding communities like Dearborn, who houses the largest Arab American community in the country. Um, one story that I was trying to um, pursue was really um, talking to local Im to, to immigrants in Detroit about um, having trouble accessing these vital documents in order to um, get their driver's license or get uh, to be able to vote and to get their citizenship as well. And it was really hard to really pin down um, some people who were willing to speak to the media. And of course, it's understandable due to their circumstances. So um, I, Alexandra and Mitra talked a lot better about it with their coverage areas. But here we definitely do keep it in mind when it comes to Detroit. It is such a joy to have all of you on, and I think that conversation could continue, and I'm glad that we get to do these roundtables every month, Mitra. I would love to turn to you. Are there questions that you want to ask our beautiful guests here, and are there priorities you want to make sure that we name before we wrap up this 2023 Looking Ahead um, preview? I do want to dive into um, the question of growing audience. This is a very selfish question, but in this age of um, you know, what the heck has happened to Twitter? Uh, Facebook has said it wants nothing to do with news controversy or giving people uh, right information. I guess I'm just wondering um, how you're reaching new audiences, if you have any thoughts on that. At Outlier, we, um, other than our documenters program, we work collaboratively with a lot of newsrooms. That means that our reach is a little um, bigger than just our own reporting. And that way we're able to connect to audiences who might be listening to radio or might be reading through a magazine. Um, and so that's one way that we reach out as well as through our SMS service system where we're really one-on-one -on -one connecting with people through text messaging, um, specifically because we can't ignore that there is a population out there that doesn't have access to the internet. Um, and in that way, we're able to still inform these communities and still inform these um, people with what is happening, as well as what issues they may be facing that we might not be knowing about um, through really this one on one, um, this one on one um, communication. And Alexandra, how are you doing it? In terms of outreach, I think we're we have a very um, committed and very loyal audience. Um, we have our newsletter, we are posting more on Instagram, and we're just doing our best to stay, stay connected to our communities the way that, you know, we always have through trust and um, honest reporting. Yeah, I mean, Mitra, to answer your question from the point of view of the Laura Flanders show, I will say we've taken a major hit um, from whatever the algorithmic changes have been at Facebook Meta. 
I mean, it is very hard to reach our online audience in all the ways we used to, because as people may know, when you post a link to an a, a, a site that is outside of the Facebook meta universe, um, you get deprioritized in everybody's feeds. So if you come up with any great strategies for us, let us know. And in the meantime, we're kind of reliant on our audience. So thank you all for being both participants and with any luck kind of um, allies in this joint effort of how do we reach our audiences and grow them and connect them and introduce them to one another. All right. Well, we are stronger together. Thank you all. And I thank you, uh, Mitra, especially for your continuing collaboration in this Meet the BIPOC Press monthly roundtable. It's a pleasure to have you part of our lineup. Thank you, Laura. Thank you so much. For more on this episode and other forward-thinking content, subscribe to our free newsletter for updates, my commentaries, and our full uncut conversations. We also have a podcast. It's all at lauraflanders.org.